Welcome into the Ether, a podcast focusing on all things Ethereum, the leading blockchain for decentralized applications. I'm Eric Connor, your host and founder of ETHUB, a decentralized information hub for Ethereum. Into the Ether features deep dives on topics with prominent guests in the community, as well as ETHUB weekly recaps featuring Anthony Sassano. Hello, everyone, and welcome into the Ether. Today, I have Ryan King, co founder and CEO of Foam, on the podcast. Foam is a proof of location protocol using radio beacons that can offer secure location independent of external centralized sources such as GPS through time synchronization. Thanks for joining me today, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me, Eric. Really excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited for this talk. Um, before we kind of dive into the details of Foam, which we'll base most of our time on, can you kind of talk a little bit about your background and how you got involved with Ethereum? Um, sure. So my formal background is in economics and political science. Um, and I was really interested in kind of urban development and how these economic forces shape um, things we see around the world, such as free trade zones, golf courses, etc., and I was a kind of a scholar in Middle East politics, uh, focusing on the Arab uprisings, so protest and policing patterns through space and where kind of different developments impact the economy and people living there. So uh, for my education, I wanted to go into architecture and urban studies. So I was doing a post-grad program at Columbia University in 2012, 2013. And this is around the time when, you know, Bitcoin was really in the news a lot. I was familiar with the technology um, for a few years prior, but not exactly involved and started really bringing in a lot of these kind of decentralized finance ideas into architectural um, projects and proposals and met my co-founders along the way, Katya, uh, our chief creative officer and Christopher, our chief technology officer. Um, Katya was a proper architect. Christopher was a geometrist doing like 3D modeling. Um, and he was one of the first employees of Consensus uh, and worked on the Haskell Ethereum client. Um, but really where it kind of all came together for us was this project called Foam Space, which was an architectural project. Um, we won a competition in New York City hosted by the New Museum to build street architecture, so something for a block party. And we proposed to build the blockchain. So we had um, 100 geofoam blocks that are about 10 feet tall that are used in construction and had them take over the street. That was the architecture for the event. Um, but probably why we won the competition was we also proposed to try to capture the value of that day by giving out a token to everyone who came, uh, the foam space token. And at the time, this was on Counterparty, uh, which was a Bitcoin protocol. And that was a really fun project where we then had a block sale selling the foam blocks at the end and had a fund and a community of people who held these tokens. Um, and as I said, uh, Christopher at the time was one of the earliest members of Consensus. So because of that, we kind of crossed paths uh, with them being in Brooklyn and got really excited about uh, what Ethereum could bring for the ideas that we started working on. Nice, nice. That's cool. And how big is your team right now? Uh, currently, we're about 12 people. Okay, cool. So I grow them pretty fast then. So I think that's a good, uh, I always kind of like to hear people's background and kind of how they got started in the space. So I think that's a good transition into foam now and kind of what your team is building. I, I think this is, at least to me, one of the more unique projects on Ethereum, like especially on Into the Ether, I've been talking to a lot of um, you know teams working on scalability or teams working on open finance apps. So I'm excited to kind of explore something different here. Um, for, so first, can you kind of describe foam? I, I would guess I would put it in its simplest sense and kind of walk us through the different aspects. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, we like to think of Foam as a protocol for building a consensus-driven map. Um, and like I said, when we started working on this kind of project, Ethereum haven't even launched yet. And even to this day, there kind of just lacks um, a lot of Web 2.0 geospatial tooling. So that's like geoencoding. How do we encode geographic information into a smart contract? Um, if a smart contract has geographic information, how do we visualize that on a front end that's map-based? And so we kind of started with trying to build these geospatial tools and bring them into blockchain for developers to use, not necessarily um, solve issues in the existing ones, although it definitely will address them. So you can think of the project in kind of three main elements. Uh, the first is called the crypto spatial coordinate. So this is a proposed standard um, for a way for a smart contract to claim a geographic address and have a, a unique identifier code. Um, so pe most people think location is a solved problem but we actually have many different kinds of geolocation encoding standards today, whether that's latitude and longitude, a postal address, um, but there's billions of places that don't have a postal address at all. Um, and there is no standard on Ethereum. So you have people using in different POCs, latitude, longitude. The other one uses a geocode 
uh, or geohash, and then now they're not interoperable. So we started first just making this standard, um, which is available for anyone to utilize. And once we have this kind of first element of the coordinate system, we then have the second element, which we call the spatial index visualizer. And that's a full stack web app and API that kind of serves as a visual blockchain explorer. So we like to think of it as a cross between Google Maps and a Bloomberg terminal. And we have a developer portal and API. It's a React web app using tools like OpenStreetMap and Mapbox for the front end and a back end that indexes the blockchain so that you could interact with a map um, and make Web3 calls. And the back end would then index that into a post SQL geographic database and then feed that to the front end. And so these two first elements are completely agnostic to any foam token and are for any developers who want to integrate geospatial aspects to their projects. Um, but the third element is what we call proof of location. And that's where the foam token comes into place. And that's on how do we actually verify and come to consensus on this geographic data on chain. Um, and so that's really where our crypto economics and our protocol come into play. But as a whole, the foam project is consisting of these three main elements. Gotcha. And, and can you kind of dive into proof of location a little bit? Kind of what what do you mean? I guess by that term, I know it's a very important aspect to to your team and to the to the project as a whole. So can you kind of just describe that a little bit? Um, sure. So in the past, we've described it as having two types of proof of location. That's probably confusing. So we're, we'll rebrand them going forward. Um, but the first would be static proof of location. So it's how do we verify things, geographic data that doesn't move. So, um, for example, that what we mean by that is points of interest data on a map. And the way that we do this proof of location, so to speak, in that is through a token curated registry so that you can build up a registry of geographic data. And if it's been verified and is on that registry, smart contracts can then rely on that as opposed to off chain. Um, but probably what's more exciting and forward looking of what we're building with proof of location is what we call dynamic proof of location. And that's how do we verify or come to consensus on things that actually move around. So whether that's a car or a person or a machine, um, how can we come to a fraud proof verified way that the, that person or thing is where they said it is in a way that a permissionless smart contract um, would be able to trust or utilize. And for that, we use low power uh, radios and a time synchronization protocol to kind of replicate the physics of GPS in a terrestrial way but open bi-directional communication so that you can speak back to the system as a customer and generate um, proofs about your location. Gotcha. So so at this point in time, kind of as far as end users go, what what can they do with the protocol at, at this point in time? Like, what are you looking for people to contribute or to be able to do? Yeah, so the first aspect of proof of location is live on the Ethereum mainnet. It launched in September and was finalized in December. So the initial kind of token um, holders uh, were in this what we call the initial use period where tokens couldn't be traded. So we have the set amount of users. Um, now that has been finalized and uh, tokens are being traded and the foam map is what we call the product. So that can be seen at map.foam.space and that's a token curated registry. So if you have foam tokens as a cartographer, you can add geographic data to the map, um, but you could also challenge points that you don't think are accurate or you think you have errors. And you can participate in votes. So right now we had over 8,000 uh, points added to this registry. A number of them, for example, like 300 have been challenged off the registry and lost. Um, and we currently have things like email notifications, uh, social profiles, a leaderboard. And so there's a lot of activity around the map through this kind of cartographer community. And the other feature that's live today is something we call signaling. And that plays into the second aspect of proof of location, the dynamic one. So when you have this dynamic proof of location and uh, these radios, there's also going to be mining rewards. But these mining rewards will be spatially weighted based on where people signal. And so signaling is staking not to a specific point of interest, but staking in a general geographic area. And you can determine the radius and the token weight. And that's basically showing that you want this future service to occur in your area. And if you were to be a miner, the rewards would be higher there. And once the system launches, that'll be a way to coordinate the distribution of coverage, because if nobody's in this side of town, you can signal there and the incentives would be higher to go set up there. But right now it really serves literally as a signal of just demand for testing these things. And you can see there's like a heat map layer and a signal layer on the phone map where you can see where people are staking tokens signifying demand for that future service. So the core functions that are live are the token curated registry and the signaling, but we also have an open API and developer portal. And we've started to see people um, build different tools and services on top of what's been launched already. 
Gotcha. So, so how to like on the points of interest, like how does this come into play? So, so you're essentially, am I right in that you're um, incentivizing people to kind of lay these points of interest out in a map, right? So, you know, and there's a lot of maps that are out there already, right? We got Google Maps. There's even open source maps, right, that have a lot of different information already built. Kind of, you know, why why do you think it's important to kind of rebuild these maps or have people put points of interest out there as opposed to, you know, potentially using these open source maps that are already out there? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So one thing that's important to keep in mind is that this is a blockchain first solution. So it's specifically um, looking to have a mechanism where you have verified data that smart contracts could directly rely on. So if you say, hey, um, these smart contracts should rely on Google Maps, well, one, you have to then solve an Oracle problem, but two, to access Google Maps' API is actually astronomically expensive. And in the last year, those rates have been going up because they really do have kind of a monopoly on geodata. Um, for other kind of off-chain uh, geodata, you have that Oracle problem as well. But if we look at something like OpenStreetMap, there are... Um, upwards of a million cartographers contributing to that data set, which is really amazing to see. But there's currently no incentives to actually check any of that data. So the regular users and contributors, they might add things, but they don't necessarily go back and look for errors. And right now, companies like Facebook or Mapbox then have to kind of subsidize the verification process, take the OpenStreetMap data and run their own algorithms, their own checks, and even human checks. And then they wind up packaging that OpenStreetMap data um, back to applications for a fee. So for example, Street Easy, Snap Map, they all pay Mapbox, including this map, the foam map. We use Mapbox as a base layer. And that's based off OpenStreetMap data, but you have this centralized kind of third party that has to do the verification themselves. Um, so we have introduced an incentive to incentivize the new class of kind of challengers or curators of this data in that in a token curator registry to add data, you have to put something up at stake. And so even if that data is true today, your store may be closed a year ago. And so there's this kind of latent bounty for someone to always be combing through that data and checking if it's true or false. And the idea is that this will be something that will make a lot more sense when we have a broader ecosystem of applications that want to hook into this protocol and be able to reference this kind of data on chain. So that's really kind of the dis distinction of kind of bringing this data on chain. It's possible to do data imports. So you could take um, data that has a license and import it wholesale to this map but then it would still have to have a token stake to it and it would still then be subject to being challenged or checked by this community of curators. Gotcha. That makes sense. So, so essentially your goal, I guess I'm trying to summarize and correct me if I'm wrong, but is to kind of build a, an open source blockchain first map using, you know, incentive mechanisms for people to keep it up to date. Is that a good summary of it? Uh, definitely, yeah. And the reason we're using like a curation market is to try to reduce information asymmetry so that the end product is an open database anyone could reference and rely on. Uh, we're not looking to make a, a marketplace for this data where you know people are selling it and buying it. The idea is that um, people are already adding data for free out there. Um, they may do so continuously on foam, but then we also offer things like you have a stake in the actual protocol. Unlike OpenStreetMap, there are incentives for participating in votes and challenges. And we are one of the first token curator registries um, live, definitely one of the largest. And so a lot of the parameters we kept more simple um, to see how this would perform in the real world. And there's an upgrade path in the smart contracts to kind of um, beef up the incentives or game theory around why, why would you add a point, for example. So we've had a ton of learnings and um, it's really something that should be seen as a slow burn. We don't think there's much benefit of having, you know, a million points tomorrow on the map. There's still not going to be these applications referencing it or needing that data. Gotcha. And and how does the incentive uh, mechanism work? Is that done through the foam tokens? So the direct payouts right now are if you're a challenger or you participate in a vote um, as a, in a challenge. And so there's a, will be a reward pool. So the kind of like active payouts are through participating in challenges or rewards. Um, the reason we didn't at this time implement like an inflation mechanism for adding points or a direct reward is because ultimately that work is still subjective, even though the goal is to build up an objective database. And so we didn't see a proposal internally or externally yet of a system where you would be directly rewarded for adding points that wouldn't open up more perverse incentives to game the system than exists today. Um, but like I said, with an upgrade path, that's something that people feel really strongly about, uh, which we already know some do. Uh, we could look to specify a model 
that does have a kind of direct payouts for adding points. But the idea is otherwise, longer term, you have your governance stake and you still own your tokens. So as contributing to that data set, tokens are getting out of the float, the more and more points being added. And as applications want to reference this data, the demand for points would increase and the people who contributed to that data set still kind of own their tokens. Gotcha. That makes sense. So it happens more on the challenge side right now. How is the um, response going on the map build out? I mean, are you, you know, obviously this is a large effort. Are there, you know, thousands of people contributing to this? Is it higher or less than you expected to this point? Or kind of how's that going on the point of interest build out? Um, so we had about a thousand people participate in the token sale. And I think the token holder numbers has gone up about 50% from that. Um and we're, I would say that my reaction is we're definitely surprised in that the activity is higher than we might have thought. Um, one of our colleagues, Mike Golden, who was one of the authors of Token Curator Registries and um, one of the contributors to AdChain, which was the first Token Curator Registry, um, a lot of people like to debate all these theoretical attack vectors or edge cases, but they have the issue of you know not enough use. And so for us, we have services like the Foam Daily Digest email service and this leaderboard where you actually see every day points have been added almost every single day since we've launched. I think there was only three days that a point wasn't added. Um, and it would be anything between you know three or 20. But for example, yesterday, 150 were added. Um, and I think that there's been an all-time high in tokens locked in the voting contract right now um, and an uptick in challenges. So I'd say in the recent months, as we've kind of launched these more social features, uh, the community is definitely becoming more active. And just overall, we're really pleased to see the kind of activity that we do see. Gotcha. So a couple more questions on the maps, and then I want to move on to the the zone acre concept as well, because I, I find that part very fascinating, and kind of then that brings us into the longer term vision here as well. But um, on the so on the map build out, it, we talked a lot about points of interest, but obviously like maps have a lot. Like say, let's use Google Maps because of course that's kind of everyone's baseline. There's a lot more there, and the, the key thing being like roads and stuff, right? Is is that something that you're interested in building out as well, or are you just does the protocol only really have to worry about these points of interest? Um, it's definitely something we would be interested in building out, but it, uh, not to kind of underestimate the effort it would involve, it would kind of be a third track, almost an entirely new project. So right now the foam um, proof of static proof of location is for points of interest data only. Um, and that data itself is actually stored on IPFS and you have the hash in the kind of on the blockchain. And through our analysis, there's a blog post about it, like the gas costs of storing that metadata on chain would already be, you know, out of the question, which is why we use IPFS. So once you start looking to kind of keep track of things like raster files and roads and geometric shapes, basically the entire base map, you're looking at terabytes of data. And so that really becomes like a big data problem and a big data distribution problem. So for right now, the phone map as an interface relies on Mapbox and OpenStreetMap as the base map. And then you can add data on top of that, which is our registry. Um, but longer term, I think that there's a lot of business and market opportunities of having a distributed map where um, customers could subscribe to different update rates. So update China once a year, update Manhattan every hour. And you would be paying to, uh, different kind of nodes to serve you these tiles, serve you this data. Right now, that all happens in a centralized way. And each week, like they release something called Planet OSM, which contains all the updates that happened in that week. So it's kind of like a blockchain in that way. And you can see that there are just like gigabytes and gigabytes of change sets every week. So to have that work in a decentralized way that's kept up to date and is fault tolerant and be able to serve all these applications is really its own protocol. But uh, you can still use the kind of primitive of a curated registry to manage it. So obviously, you know, but the end goal here isn't just to build out a map, right? You guys want to actually use this and use this point of uh, points of interest information for the bigger goal. Um, and I know that zone acres play into this as well. And it all kinds of, I guess it kind of starts there as far as using the data goes. Um, so can you kind of talk about those and exactly what a zone anchor is? Sure. So zone anchors are part of the dynamic proof of location, which will be called just foam location. And the foam location protocol is a Byzantine fault tolerant time synchronization protocol. And so you need time synchronization to do location. So the way GPS works today is that they have synchronized atomic clocks on all the satellites. And they basically, because they're synchronized, they then broadcast their time all the time. And uh, you as a receiver, you have your phone. If you receive at least four uh, signals from four satellites, so you need four, one is for X, Y, and Z, and a fourth for measuring differences in time. 
uh, that's enough data for your phone to run a trial adoration algorithm that can then basically determine your location. Um, so we're looking to kind of replicate that from a physics point of view in that we have um, low power radios. So I should add that the protocol itself is radio agnostic, so it could run on different kinds of devices. And so in our system, these radio nodes, we call them zone anchors. And at least four of them can establish a zone. So a zone is an area of coverage that these radios are servicing. And a zone basically maintains a quorum on time and space. And so they have committed with tokens being staked, uh, entering into a service level agreement to run the protocol correctly and offer service in a certain area. And so these zone anchors right now, we're looking at a specific radio called LoRa. It stands for long range. It's a low power radio that's uh, quite cheap and accessible and works in the ISM bands. That means you don't need a governmental license to be able to run these. And so yeah, that's kind of the introduction to what is a zone anchor and what is a zone. I'm happy to go more into the details of the architecture behind the rest of it and what it's for. Yeah. So now you have, say you're, you have four zone anchors hooked together, right? And they're kind of covering, um, like you put it, a, a space and time zone, right? So at that point, I guess just for people that maybe aren't familiar with foam, but just are familiar with say GPS, kind of what, what does that enable that now enables, I know, I guess for me thinking of in the simplest sense, like a car then drives through that zone and kind of can prove that they were there at a given time, which can then be stamped onto the blockchain. Is that, is that kind of the core use case there? Yeah, so pretty much the, the main thing that we're looking to provide is um, bi-directional communication. So right now, GPS works really fantastic to figure out where you, you are. So you, Eric, open your phone, you see that you're in Los Angeles. Um, you can just also open the App Store and download an app that's a GPS spoofer and change your location and then send it to me. And I have no way, I have nowhere to check if this is a real GPS message or a fake one. So spoofing is a really big problem because there's no history in the GPS log about your location. You never speak to them. So in the foam system, we have bi-directionality. So the physics are similar, uh, but it's terrestrial based in that if you can pick up these signals, you could figure out where you are. Um, but maybe you still want to use GPS for that. But what foam is going to allow is that you can then speak back to the system with a handshake, basically, um, for a small fee and generate this, what we call a presence claim, which is kind of like a receipt a cryptographic receipt about your location. And the only way you could have obtained this receipt is if you were in proximity to that zone and you were able to communicate with it over radio. And now you have this cryptographic fraud-proofed kind of receipt about your location that you can keep private. Um, and right now your location data is not really private. It's being collected by these apps and forwarded to a lot of nefarious places. Or if you're, uh, let's say, a driver in Uber and that application has dictated for you to get paid at the end of this ride, you must show me four of these receipts along your way, um, that would be the logic for that application. So we're opening up this bi-directional communication with incentives for people to offer the coverage. And then that's a marketplace for customers to interact with zones to generate these receipts. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I could see a ton of use cases for that. And in a minute here, I definitely want to dive into those. But while we're on the zone anchor aspect, because I've seen some people be interested in, in kind of how to become a zone anchor, and I'm sure kind of for building out your protocol and building out the infrastructure here, it's important that you get a lot of you know zone anchors out there, right? Because it's going to be important for this proof of location. Um, kind of what are the hardware requirements around this? How does someone become a zone anchor? Um, yeah, so like I mentioned, the protocol itself is radio agnostic. So over time, it could be on many different kinds of radios, but we're targeting using the LoRa radio to start. Um, so far, what we've done is basically prove our hypothesis that these off-the-shelf radios would be capable of running time synchronization at a nanosecond level. Um, most protocols, even using these later radios, only work on like a microsecond level, and that doesn't translate to the a meter, meter accuracy that you would need. That's more like 100 meter accuracy. And we need like two to five to 10 meter accuracy. Um, so we proved that those radios would be capable of that. Um, and as a next step, uh, just this month, we finished working on a custom firmware for these radios, which would allow us to then run our software over it. Um, as I mentioned, we are radio agnostic. So the time sync software has been developing in parallel, um, as well as the blockchain architecture behind it. So uh, to give a bit more color, each zone is running a protocol over radio, but they have to keep a log of the history of their time synchronization. Uh, and with that, we use Tendermint consensus. So each zone is kind of like its own local blockchain. Um, and the, to 
if you imagine the root chain is like Ethereum, uh, they're staking tokens to become a zone and are eligible for mining rewards. And we're using uh, a plasma construction for how to connect those. And so all that is like quite far along. And we have a local testnet called the Foam GeoPickle, which is made of 40 Raspberry Pis kind of simulating these zones. And we're uh, working towards a public demo of that quite soon, where you'll be able to have this Plasma MVP dApp and the time sync protocol running over these Raspberry Pis. Um, as this firmware I mentioned for the radio is being complete, we're going to be done testing our time sync software on the actual radios. And presuming that goes well, uh, we've recently made like electrical engineer hires, and we're going to be working towards a foam reference design board for a foam developer kit. Um, and that's where it will be really obvious once that's complete how to obtain one and become a tester, uh, because we're, we'll be distributing them or making them available. And we see today that there, through that signaling mechanism that there are people um, actively using their tokens to show that they want to be these zone anchors. So we know there's a lot of demand. Uh, and we're working towards getting this kind of developer board specified so it can be distributed. Nice, cool. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how possible it is um, in the first stage or so, but it'd be cool if you guys worked with. Uh, I, I personally have an Avado node, like a just kind of plug and play uh, node for Ethereum, and I know DAP nodes working on some hardware too. So it'd be pretty cool to somehow integrate these radios into those boxes someday, and you could kind of become an instant uh, foam zone anchor as well. Yeah, I mean, that's really what we hope to see. Uh, we think there's a lot of synergies with different projects, whether they be actual blockchain nodes or different kind of internet-based projects like Althea or even something like Filecoin. I could imagine one day you have like the uh, blockchain pro validator kit and it comes with components for all those protocols. And I think that that also targets the same kind of user type. If you want to um, hang up antennas for Althea on your roof, you're probably the kind of person who also wants to run a foam zone anchor. So there's tons of synergies in community building and ultimately hardware products. Yeah, absolutely. And, and am I right in thinking that running a zone anchor, you, that's where you can get rewarded? Yeah. So the reason that we were hesitant to give out these auto rewards for um, being a cartographer is because it's ultimately subjective and you could, you know, find ways to game it even by a day or two. But with the zone anchors that's running this BFT time sync protocol, keeping logs in Tendermint, being checked by a verifier. So what I'm getting at is that's computationally objective work. And so it's a lot more straightforward of how to then reward that kind of work with tokens when it's objectively computationally verified. So by running a node, you, I mean, running a zone, you'll be eligible for these mining rewards. But probably more importantly, you'll be eligible to service customers. And that's kind of where you'll have revenue as a zone operator. Gotcha. Okay. And you just, so you just touched on Althea, which I actually have in my list of questions here that I want to talk about. But first, I think I want to start with just kind of, you know, we talked a little bit about some basic use cases. Um, what do you kind of see the most common use cases or applications of foam ended up being? Um, so I think that through our investigations and market research, we've seen in across a array of industries, there is a latent demand for some sort of location verification service. Because every industry and company individually has this problem of stopping spoofing or detecting uh, malicious behavior. And each of those kind of companies has to solve it themselves with some sort of band-aid because nobody is going out to make an alternative to GPS and nobody's sharing with their competitors how to do that. So, for example, Uber has spent hundreds of millions of dollars on detecting drivers who are trying to spoof their location to make their ride look longer um, so they can get paid more. And on the other hand, like something like gaming, we've spoken to Niantic of Pokemon Go, and they lost out on a huge revenue stream of trying to partner with businesses that acted as Pokestops. So if a Pokemon player went there, um, Niantic could get a cut of whatever coffee or item they bought. Um, but because of the prevalence of GPS spoofing, they weren't, they're were they still to this day not able to determine fully which players are actually in the real world and which are spoofing their GPS. Um, so for us, like the main use case or the killer app of Foam is simply location verification. And you can then begin to apply that to all these different applications, whether that's the Uber driver, a game player, someone who wants to show up for a promotion, um, different things along a supply chain. But I'm most excited about things we probably can't even imagine right now. Um, for example, like a smart train ticket where you bought it, the train's not there, you are, you can get an automatic refund or discount um, showing it's late, enforcing things like geofencing for voting or even geofencing for stable coins. And yeah, really hoping that other applications that are using uh, decentralized finance and identity can hook into Foam and have that be a parameter of whatever applications they imagine. 
Yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of use cases. I mean, you explained it well earlier. I think people don't really realize how easy it is to spoof GPS. Um, so we always kind of think of, hey, we use GPS to help guide us, right? But on the other reciprocal end, that's hard for someone to say, oh, no, that person was actually there. So, you know, there's definitely a lot of value there. I think you probably just explained most of the use cases you're going to see, but there's definitely a lot of value, especially for these larger companies, like you mentioned, Uber. So it'll be interesting to see how it gets used. Yeah. And it's important to think that um, while a centralized company or a person can put all these kind of measures in place to try to detect spoofing or something um, but we look at actually a smart contract and it has a parameter of we will release these tokens if you <laughs> input that you're here. Um, anybody could just change. If they accept GPS, anyone could put any GPS they wanted and basically unlock those tokens. So if we see people spoofing to get a little bit more money as an Uber driver or spoofing to get Pokemon that have no monetary value, as soon as there are any smart contracts giving out rewards based on geographic information, people will be gaming that pretty profusely. Gotcha. And and one thing I, now that you're talking about this and kind of, you know, proving U- where Uber drivers are and stuff. And I, one thing I meant to ask on the zone anchors, how far of a distance can you plant? Will those cover? Like how many need to be sunk up at once? And what do you expect that radius to be? Like, I guess the end of this question would be across say the United States, how many zone anchors would have to be there to cover the entire States? Uh, that's a great question. Um, Part of the thing with this time sync protocol over radio, especially, is that there are so many unknown unknowns, which is why the development will be so um, dependent on our grassroots community of people who want to participate in these test nets and testing them. Um, And so that's going to be a factor of, you know, what we call line of sight. So the protocol will work probably worse in Tokyo than a desert. Um, But we can look at just some of the baseline statistics of these radios. So Laura advertises that it can go up to 10 miles distance with a 10-year battery, um, probably much less in an urban environment. But there are a lot of people running these radios already. So there are enterprise networks, mostly in Europe, where I think Europe has almost full coverage of Laura. And there are also DIY communities, namely the Things Network. And you can go to the Things Network community and see maps of where people are running Laura radios for free today. Um, For example, like Zurich, there are over 150 people. Um, In New York, maybe there's 13. And they show like the radiuses of those radios. And you can get a sense that like in New York, like 15 or 20 is going to cover a huge part of the city. But that's covering the city just with the radio signals, you know, bouncing around out there. We don't know, have an answer for how many foam zone anchors you would need to run the protocol at the correct precision, because it's going to be a factor of all these different setups. Um, so that's what we're going to need to see through all the testing, but we do have a sense of you know what the radios are just capable of out of the box. Gotcha. And the, is there any kind of uh, way for the incentive mechanism right now to say, hey, you know, we've got two hundred of these in San Fran within a mile radius, but we really need a couple over in say Wyoming, so we'll pay more for some zone acres to pop up over here. Does it work like that? Yeah, that's ex- that's exactly how the signaling um, function works. Um, so what a signal actually is, is you deposit foam tokens into a radius you define and an area, and that will then increase the foam mining rewards there. So the mining rewards will be spatially weighted. And the idea is that exactly you have everybody in uh, San Francisco running it, but nobody in Berkeley and you're an application or you're somebody relying on foam and you want to see coverage in Berkeley, you can signal there and maybe other people would as well. And kind of the first zone to appear appear there is going to get all the benefits of these weighted rewards. So if you're about to set up a new zone and you're looking at that, it's going to be wiser for you to set one up in Berkeley than join all the people in San Francisco. So it kind of could be analogous to like a difficulty where um, if there's too many people in one location, the rewards are spread out across a lot of people. And then you can increase the incentive for someone joining in a new location by signaling there. That's cool. And do you see, like, say, you know, Uber catches wind of this idea and says, hey, that we could really leverage this um, for more proof of location, right? Do you, do you picture, well, I guess you would hope, I'm guessing that you hope it's more individuals putting up these zone acres across the world, but do you envision a scenario where a company or a couple of companies come in and put these up across the world because they really want to leverage the protocol and they need to fill in the gaps? Um, yeah, not, ne- not necessarily an existing company, although it's possible. Um, but the idea is the protocol will be open and permissionless for anybody to join, um, could be as a hobbyist, but, uh, foam corp, for example, my company, 
uh, is, will be kind of setting up nodes and other people will be able to kind of make businesses out of this. So if the protocol is working successfully, the more real estate that you partner with or the more people you get access to locations to, the more zones you can run, the uh, more revenue that you can capture. So we imagine that there will be kind of professional teams or professional companies that form uh, that want to run foam zones. But uh, it's also entirely possible that an existing enterprise with either access to a lot of location or desire to have this really um, be a core part of their product offerings could themselves also be a, uh, a zone operator. Gotcha. Is there any fear of, um, to be honest, I, I don't know if there is or not, is there any fear of uh, centralization and potential manipulation of the network? If, say, someone gains too many zone anchors on the network, is there a certain amount that you would always want to kind of keep decentralized, or does that not really matter when it comes to the zone anchors? Uh, well, it definitely matters to an extent where, you know, with every, every one of these protocols, especially like Bitcoin, you always have this 51% attack situation. So anyone with more than that could do so. It's a little bit more complicated uh, with foam in that individual zones are not necessarily connected to each other. They would be topographically part of the foam network, but you could have one zone in um, LA and then not any until you got to San Diego. And it could be that the one in San Diego goes down because it's malicious, but people are able to like exit in time and be back in the root chain and be safe. And then now no one trusts that zone anymore, but the one in LA is still running. But uh, we're not really going to be launching these mining rewards until there is like sufficient test nets and sufficient testing and sufficient kind of simulations of uh, attack vectors, which we've already started, but we need kind of mass testing to really finalize any punishments and rewards and the full crypto economics of that aspect. Gotcha. So, so at this point, going back to the use cases, I mean, we've talked a lot about proof of location and how we could envision, you know, I guess, larger companies using it at a point. Um, do you ever plan to kind of become a competitor for end user GPS applications as well? Like eventually a competitor to say Google Maps, or is that not something that you're interested in? Um, it's definitely possible, but it's not the starting goal in that we're not trying to say Foam will give you navigational skills better than GPS in all locations because um, that's going to be required of coverage. But it's really about offering this new value add that GPS doesn't have in that that you can speak to the system and generate this proof um, that can be trusted by all other applications and has been checked for fraud. Um, so it's really complementary to GPS. But as the protocol expands and there is sufficient coverage and perhaps radios are upgraded or we say that all these zone anchors should have atomic clocks, well, then you have this um, the largest network of atomic clocks offering precise time sync. And at that point, maybe it's more reliable than GPS and there's enough coverage that certainly people would use that uh, exclusively. You have right now on your iPhone, you could already kind of switch which satellite network you want to use because there's not only GPS, there's a, a Galileo in the EU, there's a Russian satellite, there's Chinese ones. So you already as a consumer have an option to decide where you want to get your location data from. And so these signals will be free and in the air so anyone can receive them and figure out their location. Yeah, like you said, maybe once the everything's built out more, you don't really know what use cases are going to pop up. So that's always the interesting part about all this. Um, you mentioned Althea a little bit, and I, I think you guys are you're working together, or at least the teams are in close connection and talking. Um, can you talk about that? And uh, maybe people don't know what Althea is listening to this, but it's kind of a, a way for users to be able to share their bandwidth with others. Um, so obviously, kind of that requires hardware as well. And you mentioned someone that's maybe running an Althea satellite would also want to run, run a foam radio. Um, kind of how are your teams working together? Um, I would say at this point, we're really just in close contact and uh, have a lot of kind of parallels in terms of uh, community building is really similar and it involves getting people out there in the real world, but also coming to like scaling solutions. We're in a similar point of, you know, trying to take these layer tool tools of, from different plasma teams or the Cosmos SDK and actually put them to use in our own systems. And, you know, there aren't that many teams really in that kind of stage. So we just benefit a lot from being in kind of close contact and sharing a lot of kind of developer resources. We just had Althea in our foam community call a few weeks ago. Um, but yeah, longer term, I think there's a ton of synergy for actually bundling these protocols together and having them work together. And more technically, Althea can, or other um, mesh net routing protocols could benefit from this reliable time synchronization because it allows you to understand better how far apart the different uh, Althea internet nodes would be and would allow you to do asymmetric routing. But right now they're limited to having a symmetric kind of network setup. 
So there is benefits on the technical level, uh, community building, and right now we're just kind of collaborating and staying in close touch. That makes sense. Yeah, a lot of new, a lot of hardware is going to be required for these different protocols. Like I mentioned, hopefully this is, can kind of all get, um, you know, I know Avada and Dap Node, like I mentioned, kind of have the uh, the hardware side of um, running nodes and eventually staking. Hopefully all this stuff can kind of be implemented into one because I think people are going to really want these. I mean, the cool thing about Dap Node is just one click. Like you can install test nets, you can install, you can even run a Bitcoin node in there. Like it'd be really cool if Foam Radio or an Althea uh, satellite was built into that hardware and you could just do one click installs and all of a sudden you're becoming a um, part of that network as well. So I'm sure that's going to grow out over time. Yeah, that's definitely the synergy we would love to see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and just kind of thinking about this and talking, obviously, as much power as the blockchain enables in, in all of this, there's also a privacy aspect. I always talk about, I'm always concerned about mainstream adoption, at least on the open finance side, until we kind of have some uh, ZK snark or privacy type solutions on Ethereum, because you can barely share an address with someone. <laughs> if you're not very careful, they can see your entire financial history, essentially, right? Um is there any concern of privacy around phone? Like, how do you handle someone being able to track someone now that their data is being completely published to the uh, open source blockchain? Um, yeah, so we like to see is this solving a lot of privacy concerns that exist today around location. Um, I'll concede that the security around Ethereum is not uh, as up to par as it could be, and that forensic analysis, you could determine which public key could belong to someone. And Foam would be relying on the ecosystem at large kind of delivering solutions for that. Um, but as a location customer, no one can exactly track you unless they know um, your details already. And so what we are providing to these customers is agency on when they actually want to generate these proofs. But right now, you, you download an application, you accept the terms, you're actually losing agency and you're accepting that they'll collect your geo data. And we've seen recently there's been an expose in the New York Times about how this data is actually ending up in the hands of bounty hunters for really cheaply um, and being used for other nefarious reasons. So we have a lot of privacy concerns today around location. And the idea is in phone location, you have the agency of when you want to generate that proof, but it's also then would be stored cryptographically. So you also have the agency of when you would like to reveal it to someone else, whether that's an application, whether that's a friend, whether that's once the police showed up and they want to know where you've been. Um, and as this protocol is under development, we can look to implement more privacy solutions like different CK snarks that would allow you to do these reveals in safer ways. Gotcha. Makes sense. So yeah, it's kind of relying on these privacy solutions that once the privacy solutions are there, then you're, you're set, but still kind of relying on those. But to be fair, that's what every other application at this point is hoping and relying on too. And I think they're starting to come online. There's a lot of good work on the, on the ZK Starks and Stark side. So I think we're going to see it sooner rather than later. I think this has been a great conversation. I want people to be able to get involved. Like we've talked a lot about a lot. Your protocol depends a lot on people kind of going out there and being active in your community, which either means putting points of interest out there on the map or becoming zone anchors. So what's a good way for people to follow your team and just be sure they're up on the latest news? Do you have chat rooms or mediums and Twitters and all that? Um, yeah. So the best way to stay involved or keep up to date is that we have a weekly to bi-weekly newsletter of updates that you can subscribe to. Um, via foam.space. Uh, our application can be found at map.foam.space. Our Twitter is foamspace. And we also have a really active message board community, uh, which is discourse.foam.space, um, similar to like Ethereum research. And that's where people are kind of debating challenges, discussing votes, um, proposing feature upgrades, um, and speculating on applications and use cases. And so that's really where the community lives at the moment. So definitely feel free to join us there. And you can access tokens right now on Poloniex, IDEX, or Uniswap uh, to get started uh, using the map. And quite soon, we'll be launching a 0x widget in the map as well so that you can obtain tokens there easily. Great. Well, I think this has been a great conversation. And Ryan, I really appreciate you joining me. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Eric. Thanks for listening to the Into the Ether podcast. You can subscribe to us at podcast.ethub.io, as well as follow us on Twitter at, at econoar and at zazzle0x.